my mother-in-law did not fall in love with me when she first met me. Uh, it just it blows my mind to even think about that, but, but she really didn't. Um, now you have to remember this was the late 80s, and some of you aren't familiar with the late 80s other than watching the VH1 special or whatever about I Love the 80s. But in the late 80s, there were a couple things that were popular for the teenage, young adult, single crowd. It was the mullet or the permed mullet, as you may remember, and gold chains. Now, I'm not talking about Mr. T gold chains, but, but you know, everybody wore sort of a, a gold chain. That was what was popular back then. Just to prove it, in case you don't believe me, uh, I have some pictures. John Stamos had a mullet. You may remember that. Uh, what's funny is now his hair... This all looks the same now. He's just cut it off shorter. Uh, you may remember Billy Ray Cyrus had a mullet. Miley's dad. Uh, Austin reminded me. This is so cool. Austin had no idea what my sermon notes were about. But he and I were talking about mullets last night. And he said that Billy Ray Cyrus said that that was business in the front and party in the back was what a mullet was. So that was Billy Ray Cyrus. And then there, uh, if you were an athlete, you remember the Boz uh, who had his mullet uh, as well. Well, that was probably the best part of his game. Now, I couldn't grow the flat mullet, so I had to go with the Ian Ziering permed mullet. Yes, I uh, had a perm in the back of my hair, so it would be curly like Ian Ziering on 90210. So, it's sort of funny that when I met uh, my, my now in-laws, they weren't really excited about Monica's choice. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, I think she, said, she told Monica, where did you find him? And it's probably a good thing I didn't hear that because I would have said, she found me at the ball field because a player's got to play. No, no, I wouldn't have done that. I would not have done that. I would not have done that on purpose, but, but, uh, but you have to, you have to keep in mind. I mean, this is crispy, clean Baptist preacher and his wife uh, meeting the permed mullet, gold chain guy for the first time. So they were not tremendously excited about. Uh, me taking Monica, we were actually going to a wedding on our second date. Uh, they were really excited about that. Now, her brother loved me because I had a brand new 1988 Camaro, so that's all he cared about was I had a cool car. Uh, so I was cool with him, but her parents were not really excited uh, about her choice in me. And I remember on their refrigerator, there was a magnet. And it said, to find your prince, you have to kiss a lot of frogs. And I don't know if you've heard that phrase before, or maybe some of you have been told that phrase before, uh, or whatever. But when I saw that, it made me feel encouraged that, that she would understand I was her prince, because she had already kissed a lot of frogs. She would recognize me as her prince, because she knew what the frogs looked like. And I was excited about that as we began our dating relationship. But that sort of phrase, that mentality, sort of goes to what we're talking about today. You may want to write this down. It says, we recognize the beauty of the gospel as it dispels or shows the ugliness of our sin. One of the things that makes the gospel so beautiful to those whose lives it is working in is because we, become, we come to an awareness of the ugliness of our sin. And, and we're doing this gospel revolution um, series and we're jumping into this uh, full speed. You, you remember last week, uh, the definition of the gospel is the good news. And so what's the good news for you and I today? The good news is that in spite of our sin, in spite of uh, our fallen nature, in spite of the tendency for Rick to be selfish instead of selfless, in spite of all of that, God loves us. And so much much so that he wanted to prove it to us and show it to us that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for us. He died for my sins. All of them. All of them. The little ones, the big ones, the ugly ones, the, the, the ones that are socially acceptable and the ones that aren't. He died for all of our sins and that's good news for us today. Because if he does not do that, then guess who's on the hook for their sins? Guess who has to pay the penalty that we owe? We do. We do. 
But God loved us enough and He loves us enough that He sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. And that is good news. That is the gospel today. If you were in Life Group this week, uh, and I want to encourage you to, to sign up for Life Group. It's not too late. But if you were in Life Group this week, you heard about how the, law, the gospel begins to change us. And when the gospel begins to change us, part of what it changes is the ugliness of our sin to the beauty of the gospel. I may want to write this down. This is a quote. I'm not sure who it's attributed to. But it says, when the gospel is at work in us, it is the Spirit of God using the story of God to make the beauty of God come alive in our hearts. There's something incredible that happens when the gospel is at work in your life. It is the Spirit of God using the story of God to make the beauty of God come alive in your hearts. Maybe you've been somewhere before that left you speechless. I talked last week about how when they opened the doors in the back of the, the church and Monica came walking down the aisle, I was dumbfounded. I was speechless. I was in awe. I was like, wow. Maybe you've been in a place like that. I've, that and two other times that's happened in my life. And it's sort of funny that this happens, but, uh, but it's the grossest thing I've ever been involved in. And that's the birth of our children. Isn't it amazing how that's just gross? I mean, they're just like physically, it's just gross. But it leaves you speechless and there's nothing more beautiful in your life. I mean, I can remember that. I can remember about passing out. And then 15 seconds later going, it's a boy. Oh, it's, you know, just being so excited and, and, and consumed by our first one and then our second one. But sometimes maybe you've been to a place, maybe you've been on the top of a mountaintop and, and looked down over a valley, over trees and those kinds of things, and you've, you've just stood there speechless. Maybe you've been to a tropical island where you, you, the water is crystal clear. When you go out swimming, you see all these colorful fish and, and all these beautiful things underneath the water. And it left you like speechless. Maybe you've been hiking and... And maybe you're with somebody who knows where they're going and so you just walk through all these woods and, and all of this denseness of forest but then you come to an opening and there's this waterfall and you sort of stand there speechless. That's what happens as the gospel begins to invade our lives as we begin to get consumed by what the gospel wants to do in us and through us. We become speechless. We become in awe. We just sang that song, I stand amazed. And I've learned in my spiritual journey, which is now many years, that, that the, the more I understand the gospel, the more I stand amazed. There was a time when I didn't understand the gospel fully. I really wasn't aware of everything it had done for me. I really wasn't aware of what Jesus really had forgiven me of. I really wasn't aware of all of that. But as I've grown up in my faith, the more I become aware of that, the more I stand amazed. The more you become aware of that, it isn't like you get to a place in its old hat. The more you become aware of that, the more you're in awe of it. The more you can't believe it. And that's what the gospel wants to do in our lives. I have found in my spiritual journey that I'm amazed at three things that I want to talk about today. The first thing, I'm amazed at creation. I am amazed at creation. And I'm becoming more and more and more amazed. Maybe it's because I'm getting older. Maybe it's because now when I look at the heavens, I'm thinking I may get there sooner than I think. I don't know what it is. There was a time when all of that around me, I didn't even pay attention to it. But now as I get older, I recognize uh, the stars. I recognize Josh posted a, a sunset this week on Twitter or somewhere. And I'm like, that is a beautiful sunset. But... I'm amazed at creation. Do you realize that you are the highest creation of God? You are the only thing that when He spoke of, He said, let us make man in our image. He didn't say that about the birds, and He didn't say that about the fish. He didn't say that about the animals. He didn't say that about the trees. He didn't say that about the oceans. He didn't say that about vegetation. He didn't say about anything else but us. We are the only thing in creation that is made in God's image. And that amazes me. 
It really does. It, it amazes me how, how years of exploration and, and years of advancement in our, in our, in our NASA program, and, and now they go further out than they've ever been able to go. They can see further with telescopes than they've ever been able to see. And the further out they go, the more crazy things get. And to realize that God created all of that. God has allowed us. He gave us rule over His creation. He has given us the ability to enjoy His creation. He has given us a mind that comes to a point sometimes that says, I just can't fathom all of His creation. How awesome and how amazing is that? I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but, but maybe you've seen a beautiful sunset. Have you ever noticed that your dog doesn't sit down beside of you and go, that's beautiful. (laughs) Your dog don't care. Your animals don't care that there's a beautiful sunset. And just watching the sun, uh, you know, maybe it's coming through clouds, maybe there's rays of light coming up, whatever it is. No animal stops, no bird stops and goes, whoa, that's pretty cool. Now I'm amazed at creation. One of my favorite passages in the Scriptures, of all Scriptures, about creation. Psalm 139, listen to this, just reading verse 13 to 18. It says, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. I don't know if if that really resonates with you or not, but to understand how much is at work in your life right now to make it possible for you to even be here. And God put all of those delicate inner parts together. And you knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion and as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day passed. Oh, how precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand, and when I wake up, you are still with me. You're the only part of creation that God goes along with all day long. You're the only part of creation that God is concerned with your eternity. You are the only part of creation that God has made in His image and fashioned us in His image. You are the only part of creation that God has given a soul and a conscious. I stand amazed at God's creation. I stand amazed at it. Second thing I stand amazed at is mankind. I find it amazing that, that we can be as nice and as kind as we are. I have several friends, and, and I'm not much of a, a handyman or a mechanic, and so anything like that's going on at my house, I have to call some people. And I have some friends that I call, a couple times I've had to call two or three of them just for one project. And every time I do, they've never slammed the phone down, or they've never thrown up their hands, or huffed and puffed as they come walking in to help me. I remember there was this one project last summer that I thought, according to YouTube, was going to be very simple. Okay, the guy on YouTube just lickety split and it was done. And so I got into this project and after about an hour of what was supposed to be 12 minutes, uh, I realized I can't do it. And so I called Bobby McDaniel to come across the street. He worked on it for a little bit and he's like, I don't know. So I called Scott Godman and he came over. Or actually I called, I don't know, but they, they ended up at my house, standing in my shower, trying to fix the handle so it stopped leaking. Three people, and not once did either one of them go, Rick, you're such an idiot. Why can't you do this? We're kind. Have you ever noticed it mean what an encouraging word can mean to somebody? Have you ever gotten that encouraging word from somebody and you're like, man, that was just nice? Have you ever gotten an encouraging email? I mean, I, you know, I don't know about you, but I love, I, I get emails from time to time that are sort of like, yeah, didn't like the sermon or whatever, whatever, whatever. But I love getting the emails that say, hey, love the church. Hey, you know, enjoyed the message. Hey, whatever it might be, those encouraging emails. Man, sometimes we can be so kind. But then I watch the news. 
And it doesn't matter if I watch local news or national news or world news. I see all sorts of ugliness. I see crime. I see drugs. I see murders. I see uh, all sorts of ugliness as I look into mankind. And I'm amazed at that. I'm amazed at some points we can be so kind and at some points we can be so ugly and evil. Sometimes we can seem to be doing and saying, just being encouraging and uplifting and then the next time we know somebody is tearing them down and and ripping them apart. Listen to what Matthew said about this. It's really interesting that Jesus is talking to His disciples. It says later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives and His disciples came to Him privately and said, Tell us when all this will happen. He was talking about some signs of the, the end times. He said, what, will, what sign will signal your return and the end of the world? Wouldn't you want to know that? I mean, if you thought He could give you the answer, wouldn't you want to know? Like, what do I need to like specifically be watching for? Like, do I need to hear a horn? Do I need to be looking? I mean, just... You know, hey, is it going to be Tuesday? Because I have a dentist appointment on Monday. I mean, if you knew he was going to tell you what to look for so that you could be ready, that's what they wanted to know. Here's what he said. Don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. Not that Jesus was the Messiah. He was saying that people are going to come claiming they were the Messiah. And he says they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all of this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Get this, verse 9, it says, Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news, realize that's capitalized there. This is the gospel. And the gospel about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world. So that all nations will hear it. And then the end will come. I not only stand amazed at creation when I look out there, when I, when I see it, but I also stand amazed at mankind. Because if you read these verses, all of this is happening now. Do you understand of famines and earthquakes, of wars and rumors of wars, of persecution and arresting for believers because they're followers of Christ, that even some of them are being killed? One of the reasons I I believe passionately about the E3 ministry and helping support them is because in the light of death, they've not run away. A lot of people would just say, look, until things calm down, we're just not going in there. But they say God has sent us. And they continue to go and go and go and go. But folks, mankind is not getting prettier, we're getting uglier. We're not getting better, we're getting more bitter. We're not getting over the hump, we're getting buried under the hump of evil and of sin. And that's where the gospel comes in. Because today I stand amazed at the gospel. I stand amazed at the gospel. Listen to this powerful verse out of, chap- out of Titus chapter 2. This is an awesome, awesome passage about the gospel. Titus chapter 2 verses 11 to 14. It says, For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. Can I, can I just stop right there before you read too much further? That includes every single one of us in here today. All people. All people. You say, well, preacher, you don't know my life. You're right, I don't. Preacher, you don't know what I've done. You're right, I don't. Preacher, you don't know my story. You're right, I do not. But God does, and God has chosen to bring salvation to all people. Verse 12, it says, We are are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. 
We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. Pay close attention to verse 14 here. It says, He gave His life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us His very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. I'm amazed at the gospel today. And and verse 14 gives us four things that that should just really get us excited today about the gospel. It really should cause us to open our hearts to the work of the gospel in our lives. I hope it will bring us today to a place where we may pray and say, God, my heart is yours. God, take it, use it, make it your own. It says there that the gospel was given to us. He gave His life, that's the good news, to free us from every kind of sin. There is nothing that you are dealing with that God does not know about and Jesus did not die for. He came to free us from every kind of sin. I... I, I, Again, it's part of my spiritual growth. The the more I understand His salvation, the more I understand all the sin that He has forgiven me of. Sins that were actually did with my hands or sins where I actually physically did something, but also sins that I even thought in my mind. Sins that maybe never made it to the point of action and doing, but sins that were resting in my mind and in my heart. And He came to free us from every kind of sin. You you may be in here today and you you may have some secrets from your family or secrets from your friends or, or things that you're sort of hiding that you don't want anybody else to know about. Can I tell you that God already knows about it and Jesus has already died to forgive you of it. They're just waiting on you to respond. He came to free us from every kind of sin. And the second part there says He came to cleanse us. Not only does He forgive us, get this, this is so important, but He came to restore us. Not only did He come to forgive us, you are forgiven, but He came to restore us. It's sort of like if you were hanging out in a, in a mud pit for a while. You know, I, I know that there's a thing called the redneck games. I don't know if you've ever seen those. But, but they actually have a belly flop competition, but it's not in a pool. It's in a mud pit. And you sort of stand on the side of this mud pit and you do a belly flop and, and mud flies everywhere and all over you. And, and you stay in there long enough, you're going to have mud all over you. And so when Jesus forgives us, it's like getting out of the mud pit, but there's mud still on us. And what Jesus does is through the power of the gospel and the power of His Spirit is He begins to clean up the mess. He not only forgives us, but He cleanses us. He not only forgives us, but He restores us. The Bible says that when Jesus forgives our sins, He puts them as far as the east is from the west, and He remembers them no more. If you ever hear in your mind, oh yeah, well what about? You can know for sure that that's not God. He can't bring up something He's already forgotten. He can't accuse you of something He's already forgiven. And I know many believers that wrestle with that and struggle with that of a new walk with Christ and yet the past still haunts them. You need to know that that is not from God and that God is not the one bringing that up to you. The third part of that verse says He wants to make us His very own people. He wants to make us His very own people. I believe that there is a dialogue that continues to go on between Satan and God. 
I mean, we see it in the Scriptures. Uh, we know that Satan was once in heaven. He was a beautiful angel. Uh, and he got prideful and arrogant and thought he could take God's spot. And God said, no, you can't. And he became the devil. Uh, but there was a conversation there. He was in communication with God. You may remember in the story of Job, it was Satan who went to God and said, hey, how about your servant Job down there? Let me have a crack at him. I bet I can crack him. God's like, no, you can't. Go ahead. You even remember with Jesus, uh, Satan, it was the Satan that took him up to tempt Jesus Christ himself. I believe that there is a dialogue that goes on between God and Satan. And I believe the dialogue goes something like this. I I believe that in heaven... Satan will say to God, look at him. Look at Harris. God, you say he's one of yours? God, that that guy says he's one of yours? Look at him, God. Man, look at what he said last night. Look at what he thought this morning. Look at what he's doing. God, and you say he's one of yours? And I believe the dialogue goes like this. God looks at him and says, he's mine. Signed, sealed, paid for, and delivered. That's the power of the gospel. That is the beauty of the gospel. That when Satan is wanting to accuse you, God says, he's mine. He came to free us from sin, to cleanse us and restore us, and to make us His very own people. Why? That we would be totally committed to doing good works. We are the light of the world. We are God's light that He has chosen to use. It may befuddle us. It may surprise us. It may confuse us. We don't know why. But for some reason, God has chosen to use believers, His people, in this world. And part of the way we do that is by our good works and our good deeds, our our kind and encouraging speech, our love for one another. And and so, you know, part of the gospel working in your life is is bringing you to this place of forgiveness and cleansing and restoration and, and understanding that you're His. And when you understand all of that, it leads you to action. Not action for your sake. Not action for your glory. Not action so that people will point the fingers at you and try to give you a claim. But so that they'll give Him a claim. I don't know if you ever had somebody come up to you and go, Man, what happened to you? You know, you you ever ran into an old high school person and you begin to talk about life and they're like, Something's different about you. Something has changed and it's not just the haircut. Something is different about your life. That's the work of the gospel in our lives. He came to free us from sin, to cleanse us and restore us, to make us His own, and then to use us as a light to the world for His glory. Is the gospel beautiful to you today? It, does it leave you standing amazed? Have you felt the impact of the gospel in your life? Have you felt His forgiveness from your sins? Have you felt that cleansing and restoring power? Are you able to walk in victory throughout the week when the accusations come in your head? Oh, you say you're one of His. Oh, you really don't follow Him. You really don't love Him. You really don't care. When those accusations come, do you understand that you are His? And what is it leading you to do in life? The bands will come and and I want you to listen to this song that they're going to sing. It is... I don't know, it's right now one of my on my top of my list, so to speak, I guess, on my playlist. But I want you to listen to this song. And, and I pray as as they sing and and as they lead us and as you listen that, that the words of this song will just penetrate our hearts. That that it, that regardless of what's going on in your life today, regardless of the strife you walked in here today, regardless of what you've got to go to work tomorrow to, regardless of what's going on today, let the gospel work in your life. Guys?